There is no chronological systematic origin of the arrival of Africans in India because uh, earlier, before the Omani Arabs started the slave trade, they were vol voluntarily here as merchants or sailors and traders. So, in fact, many came as entertainers, uh, midwives. So, there has been trade and commerce, an extensive network of trade and commerce that goes back to the first century AD. And so, there are pockets of settlements everywhere from that time. But right now, the communities that are being studied by scholars are contemporary communities who are not necessarily descendants and directly linked to those communities. There is such a vast dispersal of Africans, you know, from Ethiopia, from the east coast of Africa. It's very varied and diverse. But contemporary Siddhis are traced back to British boats that were capturing slave ships. And those were brought, especially in Gujarat, they were brought to Surat or Bombay and some were absorbed in the military or the police, some became domestic workers, many were left to fend for themselves. So creatively they have adapted to their environments and anchored themselves into various communities uh, in, in different parts of Gujarat. In Karnataka, yes, the Portuguese brought them to work as slaves. And many the Portuguese, some of them were very brutal, so many were runaways. The Portuguese had treaties with neighboring Rajas that if they were captured, they had to be returned or the Raja had to pay. So I, I'm not sure how many were returned and how many just fled. So those fled to the hills of Karnataka and lived in the forests. And contemporary communities still continue to live in the forests in Karnataka. So that's the narrative in Karnataka. In Andhra Pradesh, the Raja of Vanaparthi gifted his soldiers to the Nizam because there was going to be a little rebellion in his Samasthan. There were Samasthans around uh, Hyderabad. So there was a question of succession and the uh, Africans considered themselves as the successors. So he very quickly negotiated with the Nizam and gifted them to the Nizam. So they became the African Cavalry Guard. And today, the descendants of that African Cavalry Guard are struggling because the Nizam gave them free housing. But the land is prime property, as you know, in Banjara Hills. So. There is an eye on uh, their land and many are struggling economically there. First of all, the scheduled tribe status has been given to Siddhis in Saurashtra. And Siddhis of uh, South Gujarat have been left out. So there is an arbitrary way in which the state has designated one group of Siddhis, scheduled tribe. Another group of Siddhis hanging somewhere. In Karnataka too, they had to fight to get scheduled tribe status. And it was a protracted, prolonged fight in which, you know, the Siddhis have asserted a lot of agency. They did demonstrations on the street, they did uh, street plays, they did all kinds of uh, assertive work and then the government finally gave them that status. Now, what that means for them is the next question. Because you have to go through a series of bureaucracy, fill out forms and applications. Where do they have the literacy? The same in Saurashtra. Though in Saurashtra, many went into the post office to work as the level of peons or to work in the railways or any kind of government agency. Um, so, some have benefited, but now with the whole ST also such a contested territory and so invested with political ambition, um, Siddhis are once again struggling. Now, what's happening in Saurashtra is that other communities are claiming Siddhi status. 
and they are displacing Siddhis from government jobs. And this is what I have heard from interviews, uh, extensive interviews I have done in that area, Jamnagar, Junagarh. So they still don't have enough resources to come together as a group and fight for their rights. The numbers are small. I think uh, they are asserting agency in various ways. Um, for example, I know a young couple in Bombay who have migrated from Karnataka. Uh, he was a former athlete uh, in the special area games that were started in the 80s, the 80s programs in Karnataka and in Gujarat. Several of them through the special area games got jobs in the railway, armed forces, or this young man, uh, as an athlete, he got a job in the Employees Provident Fund. So those jobs were openings for them. And now, based in Bombay, he and his wife, who is also Siddhi, have started a casting agency. So they are working with the flourishing advertising agency in Bombay. Uh, a young man from Gujarat uh, plays the keyboard, and he is working in a club somewhere and earning a living. So they have definitely created new jobs and, and are opening up new uh, forms of employment. But clearly many are still working in the domestic area. Dance I think will always stay part of their cultural lives. It's very, very much part of how in Gujarat they came together to form a community and actually as dispersed slaves, this was one element, music was one element of healing. And today in South Africa, even today, there are institutions of healing or cults of affliction as they are called by the scholar John Jansen where they are called Goma and that's the word Siddhis in Gujarat use, Goma. They also use the word Dhamal for their dance. Now these cults of affliction in Africa are actually meant for healing dispersed people. In South Africa, for example, when the white people took over the farms and diamond mines and made African servants and slaves, they needed that kind of collective healing. So when these, uh, when you, John Jansen studied these cults, he saw how they were adapted to the circumstances of that environment and th that they still are fluid categories. Goma means song, dance, drum. Those memories Siddhis carried over to Gujarat and those memories they have retained. So dancing is very much connected to spirit possession and healing.